This is a story about a wildly popular band in the late 1970s and early 1980s. It's also a story about one of the most notorious serial killers of that era. This is the story of Blondie and how one fateful night in the 1970s very nearly led the band to not existing in the first place. It's a story of Debbie Harry's fateful car ride with Ted Bundy. Chapter 1, The Blondie Legacy. Blondie is a renowned band from the United States. The group, who formed in the late 1970s, was fronted by Debbie Harry, who would become an icon in the punk and new wave music scenes. Debbie Harry boldly challenged the male-dominated rock scene, but before she made waves in music and culture, her name very nearly became part of a different, much darker, iconic list. A victim of serial killer Ted Bundy. Blondie's sound blended elements of punk, pop, disco, reggae, and more, creating catchy and influential hits. Many charted like Heart of Glass and One Way or Another off of Parallel Lines from 1978 and Rapture off Auto American from 1980. They were true pioneers, most notably in punk, post-punk, and new wave. Debbie Harry herself was and continues to be to this day a striking individual and a cultural icon with stylish looks and a confident persona. Their chart success is equally storied and legendary. One, Heart of Glass. It reached number one in several countries, including the United States, the United Kingdom, and Australia. Two, Call Me. This was featured in the film American Gigolo and reached number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. The Tide is High reached number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart and was a hit in multiple countries. Atomic, a top 40 hit in multiple countries, including the United States and the United Kingdom. And there was Rapture, which became the first rap-influenced song to reach number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. Chapter 2, Rapture. Rapture was the first rap-influenced song to reach number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. Not necessarily featuring rap as we'd recognize it today, it does contain lyrical traits and delivery from the genre of the day. Rapture is one of the first pop songs to feature rap vocals and thus the first to chart significantly, with Debbie Harry delivering a rap section in the middle of the song. The band was influenced by the emerging hip-hop culture in New York City, and they wanted to incorporate elements of rap into their music. The song reflects the vibrant and diverse street culture of New York City in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Debbie Harry and Blondie were deeply connected to the downtown scene, and Rapture captures a lot of that energy and creativity of that era. It also draws from disco and dance music, with its infectious beat and kind of a groovy bass line. Where the song's disco-inspired sound was influenced by the club scene of the time where disco and dance music were pretty dominant, the lyrics contain numerous pop cultural references, including mentions of early hip-hop group The Sugar Hill Gang, artist Jean-Michel Basquiat, and actress Marilyn Monroe. These reflect Blondie's immersion into the cultural scene of New York City and their desire to capture the zeitgeist of the era. In the context of the Blondie song, rapture may refer to the euphoria or ecstasy experienced while dancing and enjoying oneself, reflecting the energy and joyous vibe of their music. But in religious contexts, it often refers to a state of being transported to a higher realm, especially associated with Christian theology regarding the end times where believers are said to be taken up to heaven. In that regard, it centers around death. Well, let's pivot to that. Chapter 3, Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy was one of the most notorious serial killers in American history. Born Theodore Robert Bundy on November 24, 1946 in Burlington, Vermont, his horrific crimes spanned several states throughout the 1970s. To this day, he remains a symbol of evil and the depths of human depravity. Bundy confessed to killing at least 
30 young women, although the actual number may be higher. Known for his charm and good looks, he used these to gain the trust of his victims before brutally assaulting them and murdering them. Bundy often targeted young women, luring them with various tactics such as feigning injury or posing as an authority figure. Apprehended in 1978 and convicted of multiple counts of murder, Bundy's case gained widespread media attention and fascination due to the heinous nature of his crimes and his ability to elude capture for many years. He received multiple death sentences before ultimately being executed in the electric chair on January 24, 1989. Chapter 4. Bundy's Volkswagen Ted Bundy's light-colored 1968 or 1969 Volkswagen Beetle played a significant role in some of his crimes and his eventual capture. With its cramped interior, Bundy modified the Volkswagen to ease in his abductions and murders. He was pulled over and arrested for multiple traffic violations while driving this car, which ultimately led to his capture. And it plays a crucial role of when Blondie met Bundy. Chapter 5. When Harry Met Bundy. Ted Bundy's Volkswagen Beetle became a chamber of horrors, and Debbie Harry would come to realize the grim truth concealed within its confines. In the gritty backdrop of the early to mid-1970s New York City, a city shrouded in the grip of a violent crime wave, the streets whispered of danger and dark. Visitors arriving at the city's airports were greeted not with welcoming signs, but with pamphlets bearing ominous warnings, adorned with a hooded skull proclaiming, Welcome to Fear City. For those like Debbie Harry, navigating the nocturnal labyrinth of the city meant confronting harsh realities of urban life head on. The nightlife in particular. Before Blondie skyrocketed to fame, Debbie Harry's journey unfolded amidst the pulsating heart of New York's nightlife, and as a waitress at Max's Kansas City, the legendary nightclub and watering hole with strong parallels to the underground music scene, Harry found herself immersed in a world where the lines between celebrity and chaos often blurred. Max's was a haven for luminaries ranging from ex-Beatle John Lennon to the enigmatic Andy Warhol. Alongside the city's vibrant punk scene, many top acts of the day performed there, frequented there, and other artists who had not yet had their break, say Thurston Moore from Sonic Youth, would frequent that location as well. Yet step outside the glitz and the glamour, and Harry would experience firsthand the lurking shadows and imminent danger those infamous pamphlets decried. Debbie would recount having a chilling encounter with one of America's most notorious serial killers. In one hot summer, as neon lights flickered and the streets teemed with life, Harry found herself at the mercy of fate when she accepted a ride from a stranger. I realized I'd made a big mistake. Recounting the harrowing ordeal in a 2002 interview with Mojo Magazine, Harry spoke of the stifling heat, the suffocating silence, and the palpable sense of dread that gripped her as she sat trapped in Bundy's car. Only through a stroke of luck and her quick thinking did she escape the clutches of the serial killer, evading a fate that befell so many others at Bundy's hands. It was late night and I was trying to get across Houston Street from the Lower East Side to 7th Avenue, she recalled. For some reason there were no cabs and I was wearing these big platform shoes. This car kept circling round and round. This guy was calling out, come on, I'll give you a ride. Finally, I cave in and I got in the car. Once she was inside, the realization that something wasn't right was almost immediate. For one, it was very hot in the car and the windows were rolled up nearly to the top. The guy had a white shirt and he was very good looking. Then I realized this guy had the worst BO I had ever smelt. Then I looked over at the door to crank down the window and saw there was no door handle, no crank. I cast my eyes around and saw that the car had been gutted. There was nothing there. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up. Still, when he had called out to her, the window was opened a little. Remember, this is the mid-1970s. There was no such thing as automatic windows in those days. So Bundy couldn't just push a button on his door and have the passenger window roll all the way up. She stuck her hand through the gap in the passenger window and tried to open the door handle from the outside. As soon as he saw that, he tried to turn the corner really fast, she said. The car lurched to the left which, through sheer fate, flung the door open. I spun out of the car and landed in the middle of the street. Debbie now fully outside the car, Bundy kept driving. 
In the dangers of 1970s New York City, the true terror of the experience wouldn't truly hit Debbie Harry until many years later. Perhaps it was the same year Blondie released Parallel Lines and Ten Bundy was finally captured, 1978. Maybe it was the year Blondie released Auto American in 1980, upon the third and final death sentence Bundy received. Maybe it was many, many years later when he was executed in 1989. The terror was there. Blondie's rapture may have been about the euphoria of dancing and enjoyment, but sometime in the mid-1970s, Debbie Harry very nearly experienced a quite different rapture at the hands of one Theodore Robert Bundy. If you like stories like this, next dig into how legendary punk pioneers Sex Pistols actually boosted Elvis Costello's fame in the United States. You can check that one out right up there. As one YouTuber said many moons ago, and another much more recently, Trish Bowes, I'm looking at you, this dude is a damn nerd. I am Andy, this is the Fence Post Vinyl Channel. Shout out to Trish for becoming one of the channel's latest members. I'll see you in the next video.